Okay, thank you for that minimal introduction. Um, thank you everybody for coming back, those who, who did come back, and happy to see you other people who are giving this a first try. So um, the theme of the lectures, as I mentioned in the first lecture, is self-organizing systems. And yesterday I talked about systems that synchronize themselves, mainly inspired by biology and some physics problems. Today I would like to talk about social networks, not the kind, not, I'm not talking about Facebook and Twitter, I just mean a very abstracted version of social networks that allows us to prove some theorems and do a little bit of math. So the um, work is done in collaboration with Seth Marvel, my grad student, and um, John and Bobby Kleinberg, who have lots of MIT connections. So the first thing I like to try to do is give you a, a feeling for what the soci well, social scientists, sociologists mean by balance, and uh, emphasize that it's a static concept, that it's something that is a, a, a version of equilibrium in their way of thinking. But, you know, whenever we talk about an equilibrium state, then behind the scenes there's some dynamical system. But in sociology, it's not quite explicit what is that dynamical system. So I, I'd like to then, in the second part of the talk, try to motivate the question of going from statics to dynamics. What is a reasonable dynamical system that will lead a social network to this state that the sociologists think of as balanced? Um, the third part of the talk will be in a, a discussion of one possible dynamical system that would be self-balancing. And it uses ideas from physics and, and graph theory mainly. But uh, it turns out that it's kind of hard to analyze. It, it seems like we can make some good conjectures about its properties, but there are some open questions there that still need to be resolved. So in search of a, a simpler example, we then will go to part four, where there's a differential equation model of a, a dynamical system that actually does turn out to be self-balancing. And that part will um, use a bit of linear algebra and ordinary differential equations and some basic ideas from random matrix theory. So here's a situation that you might have encountered in your own lives. Um, <laughs> Alice, Bob, and Carol, three people who have these relationships. So I'm going to use green to mean, uh, like, go forward, I like you. Green is a, a positive relationship, a friendship. And sometimes I'll use a dashed line to mean, I hate you, <laughs> or at least I dislike you. Um, it's not, so I may show it in red, like stop don't come any closer or dashed. Anyway, so you'll see different notations. But anyway, why is this stressful? Um, there are some seats over here by the camera. You, you should probably get them while you can. Uh, go ahead, this would be a good time to do it. It's not embarrassing, because I said you could come over. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, there you go. There's also a seat in the front. OK, excellent. <laughs> So now what is stressful about this situation is um, Carol is friends with both Bob and Alice and they don't get along. You might think of the case of a couple and you used to be friends with this couple back when they were going out or married but then they have a very um, acrimonious divorce and now they're both talking all kinds of bad stuff about each other to you, their trusted friend. This is stressful because yeah, <laughs> I don't have to explain why, right? That is stressful. So what you do in a situation like that is you say, please get back together. That would solve everything. Or, as far as you're concerned, or you could just ditch one of your friends and, and, or maybe even start disliking that person in favor of the other one. You could pick a side. So the sociologists consider a situation like this to be an unbalanced triangle, meaning there's some kind of psychological forces, tension that is tending to uh, want to resolve itself in one of those two ways that I mentioned. Now, in contrast, there are balanced triangles like these. Um, the one on the left with all green is simple. Everyone in the triangle likes each other, and so there's no reason for anyone to change their way of thinking. This case on the right is considered also balanced. It doesn't mean that it's all friendly. Um, you might think of it this way. Nothing cements a good friendship like hating the same person. That's the situation here. A and C like each other and they agree, you know, what a knucklehead B is. And B feels the same way about both of them. 
So everything is kind of stable. Nobody has any reason to change their mind about anything. And this follows the ancient logic of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right? That is, um, C could reason, here's my enemy, and that's the enemy. That makes that person kind of appealing. A and C like each other. You can also, you know, looking at it from C's point of view, you could look at the, the friend of my enemy is my enemy, that sort of thing. So anyway, these are considered balanced, but I don't want you to confuse balanced with all friendly. Th think of balanced as a kind of standoff. That is, there's a stalemate and no one wants to change their mind. Everything is, in that sense, stable. But it doesn't mean stable like, um, I mean, a war could break out. That would be consistent with it being stable in this sense. All right, it just means I know who my allies are and I know who my enemies are. That's what the sociologists mean by balance. And they're thinking about balance in the context of international relations, especially this developed during the Cold War when the world was polarized into the, you know, the Soviet bloc of countries and the um, Western bloc. All right, now, 1946 is when the theory first was articulated by a social psychologist named Heider, who there's a third, a fourth possibility we didn't talk about, which is three nodes that all dislike each other. That is considered unbalanced in the usual version of the theory. Some sociologists don't consider this unbalanced, but in, this, in the simple version I want to discuss now, we will consider these two to be unbalanced. This one, as a rough approximation, you might think of as when Hillary and, and uh, Obama were still in the primaries, Remember, and they were mad at each other, but they really didn't like McCain. So they ended up teaming up. But for a while, that is, that was sort of unstable. It's a common situation when you have three parties that don't like each other for, for two of them to team up on the third. Um, and so that will resolve itself into uh, that situation, typically or commonly. Anyway, so um, these are the two types of situations, balanced or unbalanced triangles. And if you want to think of it different, another way, you could say that the unbalanced ones have odd numbers of uh, negative edges or dashed edges, and the balanced ones have even numbers of dashed edges. Now, suppose we want to go to a network rather than just a triangle. That is, think about a, like the United Nations, maybe a few hundred countries. Everybody has to decide, is this my enemy or my friend? And you would like to do it in a psychologically consistent way that obeys the logic of the enemy of my enemy is my friend and all those other adages. So we're thinking here of a, a close-knit community where everyone has an opinion about everyone else. They all know each other. And so this prevents, we're not talking about an enormous network where some people would be indifferent. Think of something like a department at an institute of technology or think about something like the United Nations or any club where everyone has to have an opinion plus or minus about everybody else. Now indifference is not allowed. You could have a generalization of the theory where you have no opinion about someone but that's an again I'm not going to discuss that complication. So in this framework where we're now assigning pluses and minuses to the edges of a graph, um, the criterion for balance you could think of as that the product of the signs around the triangle is positive. Three pluses would make a positive multiplied together, or you know, the bit about cementing a friendship by hating a common third party, that will give two minuses times a plus, that's also a plus. All right, now that's um, how we're going to think about, so we're looking now at a complete graph, every edge that could be there is there, and then our definition will be that the complete graph is balanced if all of its triangles are balanced. All right, every triangle is, so to speak, psychologically stable. And there are lots of triangles in the complete graph. So the question then becomes, what would a complete graph look like uh, if it's balanced? That is, what kinds of sign patterns have the property that every one of their triangles is balanced? And you might think about that for a minute. I mean, can you guess some examples of what, what those would look like? Uh, Jim Prop is indicating that there's an open seat over here. Okay. Everybody loves everybody. Everybody loves everybody is balanced. That is certainly one balanced state. And, you know, if you were kind of thinking about it like a physicist and thinking of this as like ferromagnetism or something, then this is, this is an obvious ground state. But it turns out there are other ground states. Oh, yes, Danny Kleiman says you could have two blocks where everyone in this block likes everyone on that side, everyone in this block likes everyone here, but they all hate each other on the other side. That turns out to also be balanced. Yes? 
Can't you just start with everyone liking each other and then flipping any subset of people? If you start with everyone liking each other, but then flip. Take a subset and then flip. How about I flip one edge? No, flip all the neighbors of each guy you take in your subset. Oh, that might work. I don't know. Anyway, the, the character is, I have to think about that. You're saying you choose one person and then, yeah, then make all those pluses to minuses? It changes all the triangles by even number. Uh-huh. So I think it doesn't. That, that may be equivalent to what I'm about to say, which is this, this theorem. That's just what you guessed, that you can certainly have two factions shown here, or you could have everyone liking each other, like David said. But it turns out those are the only possibilities. That is, for instance, you cannot have a balanced situation with three factions or more than three. It has to be exactly two. There has to be a way of dividing the graph so that everyone, you know, so the partition is like this. And so that's a theorem of Frank Harari that has such an easy proof. I'll just show it to you right now. You, you might ask yourself, all that we know is that it's balanced. Is that enough information to compute the partition? And it is. You don't need anything else. You just say, well, how would I start a proof like that? All right, pick some person. There, we're on our way. Now, what's natural to think about in respect to that person? The person has, as you suggest, friends and enemies. So we could draw up what they look like. There are the friends. There might be, it might be the empty set. This might be <laughs> not a very likable person. But, but for the sake of illustration, let's suppose that the person has um, two friends. There may be more. These are just two typical ones I want to show. And the person also has some enemies. And now, um, by my color convention, I would draw things like that. I've got green arrows, to, green edges to my friends, and red to my enemies. But now we can start filling in the picture by insisting that this is a balanced, we said it's supposed to be balanced. So that means, like look over at the green edges. In order for the ABC triangle to be balanced, that edge has to be green. And similarly with the two reds, because balanced triangles only have even numbers of reds, that has to be green also. And then looking at something like on the top, ABD, in order to get one more red, we have to do that. And similarly, that. So this, the, the statement then is that if we look at the set consisting of A and all of A's friends, that's the partition. They all like each other, but they all have red edges to everybody over on that side. And so that's it. The, this system can only have the, the two faction. And as I say, one could be empty, in which case everyone likes everyone. So that's Harari's balance theorem, which you could now think of this way, that you know, we started out by talking about balance as a local property about triangles, a, a node and the triangles it's involved in, based on this psychological consistency way of thinking. But you can also equally well, I mean, it's equivalent to think of balance as a theory about global polarization. It's a theory of, of networks that split into two hostile factions. And either way of looking at it is equivalent. Uh, this is assuming everybody talks to everybody, right? You know? We're only assuming everybody talks to everybody throughout the whole talk. Yeah, so a good um, open area. I mean, people have generalized this to arbitrary networks to some extent, but the theory is especially nice in this case, and so that's all I'll talk about. And the dynamics part of it is, is pretty recent. That is, this is just statics. The, the um, static part has been looked at for many years. Here's an example, concrete, I don't know if you can see it too well, <clears throat> that I borrowed from a paper of Sid Redner and uh, Tibor Antal and Paul Kropisky, and Sid's in the back, so, um, hi Sid. <laughs> Take a bow, take a bow. But, but so um, Sid Redner, a colleague at BU, who's a physicist, has um, helped lead the way to thinking about the dynamics of these systems. And as an, a motivating example, he shows this, um, he and his colleagues show this neat picture of what the countries that ultimately got involved in World War I, uh, what they were doing in terms of their alliances in the years running up to World War I. So I don't know the history, and I'm just going to give you some pseudo history. I do have dates here about these different treaties, but um, I don't know how readable it is from the back. Can, are you not readable? Okay, so let me talk about it. Here's um, Russia, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, I guess it's Austria-Hungary, Germany, Italy, France, Great Britain. And in the first state where it's called the Three Emperors League, this is around 1872, you see, um, Italy doesn't seem to have any friends or enemies. This picture should be the complete graph, but there's some edges missing. So we don't really know what Italy feels, but at some point it decides to become friendly with Germany. 
That happens in the Triple Alliance. And that forms, meanwhile, Austria-Hungary becomes friendly with Italy too, forming this nice balanced all friendly triangle over here. Uh, now what happens next in something called the German-Russian lapse is that Russia, <laughs> I mean it's interesting, what, what's the problem here for Russia? It, I don't know, it, it was friendly with Austria-Hungary but it was, hmm, I don't know, does anyone know the history of this? Why did Russia, at some point Russia got mad at Austria-Hungary <laughs> and now has a, the not, Balkans. the Balkans? Yeah, I don't know what happened. They, they got two red edges here. They're mad at Germany and Austria-Hungary, but then, uh, Serbia. Serbia? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, Russia starts to take on new friendships here. Russia becomes friends with France, but meanwhile, France, as usual, doesn't like Great Britain, and Great Britain doesn't like Russia. That's a nice little stable arrangement there, but um, what happens next? Down here, uh, uh, it, hmm, not quite seeing the diff. Oh, yes, France and Germany, which were enemies. I'm sorry, France and Great Britain, which were enemies, realize you hate Austria-Hungary, so do I. And then they like each other. So now they're forming, and then they start to see that Russia likes France, and France likes Great Britain. Maybe they should be friends, and then they are. So it ends up settling into these two blocks. 1907, and this is the way it was before the war started. But this is now finally a balanced state. These three are together, those three like each other, but they all hate each other across. And so these balanced states can be kind of implacably opposed. And again, I don't mean to say that they're stable in any nice sense. They just don't change their mind until they end up shooting. And that even then they didn't change their mind. So. These are the shifting alliances. Now the question would be, what's going on dynamically? Can we make a little, I mean, I've given a clumsy story about this. I don't really know the actual stories. But um, that's what we're going to try to develop, is some dynamical theory of how the different triangles will change their edges. So in the second part then, looking from statics to dynamics, can we figure out a rule for changing edges, pluses to minuses and vice versa, with this goal, the ambitious, we would like it to always end up balanced. For any initial sign configuration, can this system just evolve to fully balanced? If that's too ambitious, we might settle for something like a, a rule that has the property that with probability one as the size of, or approaching one as the size of the network goes to infinity, it will become balanced. Maybe there's some small exceptional set of initial conditions. That would be okay too. So that's the kind of thing we want to look for. Now. Um, in this third part then, here's a candidate rule that I'll be discussing that comes from Redner and Kropivsky and, and Antal, which is a, maybe the first thing you would think of. It's a kind of gradient descent. You, you just pick an edge at random and look at it and now you consider flipping its sign. And you would do that if it increases the number of balanced triangles in the whole network. That is any sign flip will disrupt some triangles but maybe help others. And so if it turns out that that's worth doing. If you end up stabilizing more triangles than destabilizing, then do that flip. Otherwise, don't. That's going to be the rule we'll consider. Right? That would seem to be improving the situation as far as the whole network is concerned. And so you can think of it as an energy um, descent down an energy landscape by defining an energy, which is the number of unbalanced triangles in the network minus the number of balanced triangles. And for the sake of normalization, let's divide by the total number. Which that can then be written this way. Um, if I define numbers plus and minus one on each edge and multiply them together, remember then for a um, balanced triangle, this will be positive. But we like to think of energy going downhill as you get more stable. So put a negative sign in front and then I'm normalizing by the number of triangles and choose three. So we're then going to sum over all triangles. That then is just a way of counting what I said up here in the first line. Uh, notice this is not just like the Ising model of, you know, if you're a physicist, you may be thinking this sounds a lot like frustrated triangles in an antiferromagnetic system or a spin glass. It's not that, because there the variables are defined at the nodes, right? Plus one or minus one at the nodes. Here the variables are defined on the edges. So it's, it's different. And also we're taking a triple that is we're multiplying these three S's, we're not in the Ising energy, it would be the product of two edges, uh, sorry, two um, spin signs across a common edge. 
So it's a, it's a bit different than the usual thing in, in statistical physics. But anyway, there's a very natural energy for this problem. And you can draw an energy landscape. Here's for some small examples. Suppose we just had um, a single triangle. Then with this definition, these two states have energy 1 because they have one unbalanced triangle. And this has energy negative 1. It just has one balanced triangle. Um, here, for four nodes, these are all possible configurations. The numbers above them show their multiplicity if you start you know, considering equivalent states through symmetry. And here the rule of gradient descent works pretty well. That is, if you just always flip an edge when it will um, increase the, the net number of balanced triangles, you'll end up down here in one of these three lowest energy states, the balanced, fully balanced states. So for small networks, it, it does work every time. But the trouble is that for bigger networks, it stops being foolproof. Because of uh, the existence of what you could think of as metastable states or what um, Redner and company called jammed states. So these are an obstacle, in a sense, to this discrete dynamics in that you know, you're trying to go downhill, but you get stuck in a local minimum. Um, or, now, I want to distinguish between a, a strict local minimum where any flip I make would take me uphill or something which is could allow for neutral directions. So the term jam state means any flip you make doesn't help. It might make it worse or it might be keep you at the same energy. So that's what I'm calling jammed. Strictly jam means any flip you consider making makes things worse. You're going to go up in energy. Now there, there are jammed states, lots of them. And here's an example of a strict one which you could think of in basketball terms. I couldn't really think of a good social example of this, so maybe you could suggest something better. I, I didn't want it to be like the Jews, the Catholics, and the Protestants. That feels like um, not nice to talk about stuff like that. Or <laughs> so, so, and it's also not really true that they all you know, hate each other. So, so, uh, but I think it's a closer approximation. The fans of the Knicks it don't usually like the Lakers fans or the Celtics fans and I don't know there may be a better example but so bear with me anyway these these three factions have this property that they like you know the people like them but dislike the others and that is strictly jammed notice here there's only two types of edges to consider there's the ones within your faction or the ones to somebody else let me just convince you that any move you make will go uphill um, for example Here's a case where there are two friends. There's a Nick fan who likes another Nick fan. And um, we could consider, should we flip this edge? Would that increase the number of balanced triangles? No, not at all. Because the Nick is, these fans are perfectly balanced with this Nick fan. And they're also perfectly balanced in that they hate everybody else. And so they're currently in seven balanced triangles and none unbalanced. So it's definitely a bad idea to flip. That will make seven things worse than they currently were. So you don't want to flip that edge. But you could also look at this. What about, how do I feel about my enemy? So here's a Nick who doesn't like a Celtic fan. Um, they are in this triangle, which is balanced. That is, this Nick likes that Nick fan. They both dislike that Celtic fan. These first, sorry, it's such a screaming color pattern. But the, I'm trying to make it easier to look at. The first four examples are balanced. And these last three are unbalanced. And so if you flip that edge, you would go from having four good ones and three bad ones to the opposite. And so it would be worse. All right. So there's really no move you can make that is favorable. Um, that is the smallest example we could give of a state that's strictly jammed. And so for the rest of this third part of the talk, I just want to hint at a few of the results we found. Because we got curious. Well, we're already in the world of negative results here. This is, we don't want any of this to be happening. Right? Remember, we want to be finding a rule that goes downhill to the balanced state every time. But now that we've found this obstacle, let's learn a little more about it before dusting it under the rug. Um, so the kinds of things you could ask are, how high can the energies of these local minima be? Um, what are they like structurally? How do they depend on how big the network is? How, how rare or common are they? Here's one easy bound that you could give. They, remember that negative 1 is the lowest energy and positive 1 is the highest energy. 0 is halfway up the energy landscape. 
And it's pretty easy to see that you can never have a jammed state higher than zero in energy. And um, the argument, let me just outline it. You, you could think about it this way. So if I'm an edge that's in a jammed state, then by definition, that edge doesn't want to flip. Right? That's what it means to be jammed. It's happy the way it is. It doesn't want to flip. That means it has to be in at least as many balanced triangles as unbalanced. And so now, if we're calculating the energy of this state, that's the number of unbalanced minus balanced triangles over the whole network. At the moment, we're just thinking about the triangles that that edge participates in. It looks like that fan, that picture I showed with the Knicks and Lakers and Celtics. Uh, so the way to break up the calculation is instead of summing these triangles over the whole network, do it one edge at a time, looking at that edge and all the triangles it participates in. That produces a term in the sum that we know is non-positive because of the argument I just made. And then I do that summing up until I eventually count all triangles in the network. Um, and so it's just a big sum of non-positive terms, so non-positive. So that's really all there is to it. It's, it's an easy um, estimate that zero is the upper bound on what a jam state could have as its energy. But you could then look for how close can I get to zero. That is, if here's a numerical simulation looking at um, many networks. Uh, for now, we're just studying networks of size 26, as I wrote there in the side. We start with all negative edges. We look at an edge that would want to flip at some stage in the calculation and um, flip it and then keep doing that until no more edges want to flip. And if you do that and then just run for a long time, you find that the energy, you're looking here at like the world record that you've ever seen of the highest energy jammed state. It goes up pretty fast at first and then it starts slowing down. Uh, here we've done a million networks and we're at this level, negative 0.2, but the slope is not looking too good. I mean, if you extrapolated, when would this hit zero? You'd be searching a lot of networks that um, it's not really clear from this picture. Is there an upper bound less than zero or what? So uh, for a while, we weren't sure what the answer was. Could we construct something that strictly achieves the upper bound or is there some of zero or is there something else? Well, the guess was that zero would be tight and it is tight. That is, you can write down jam states with zero energy, uh, even for arbitrarily large networks. And um, in the sake of, or for the sake of honesty, I'll just admit that we blundered across them before we knew how to construct them by these numerical experiments, that there were a couple of examples where they, they did achieve zero, and um, John Kleinberg, who knows about graph theory, recognized that the positive edges in the graph were something that he had learned about called Paley graphs, which I hadn't heard of at the time, but he illuminated me. So let me tell you, if you are from my culture and don't know about graphs. Um, here's, here's a little bit about Paley graphs. So you've heard of the Paley-Wiener theorem, maybe. It's that Paley, very smart guy from Cambridge, um, who I think maybe was a student of Littlewood, or I don't know. Does somebody here know about Paley? Uh, anyway, Paley, I think maybe died young. Did he have like a mountain climbing? Gil, you're nodding. What's the story about Paley? He died in a climbing, in a climbing accident, right? Yeah, it pa sounded like Paley was quite a brilliant mathematician who met an unfortunate early demise. But so, um, so I'm not giving you the most general version of Paley graphs. The, they could be defined for numbers Q that are prime or a power of a prime. But let me just for the sake of simplicity uh, talk about the case where Q is a prime rather than a prime to some power. Then uh, the reason that case is easy is we can just think about mod Q arithmetic instead of having to work over a finite field. So it'd be a little easier. The, the picture is like this, that to construct, here's the Paley graph on 13 vertices. Um, you define an edge to be present between two nodes, thinking of the nodes as just clock arithmetic, uh, numbers 0 to 12, if the difference between the two numbers is a square, mod Q. So to give a concrete case, 0 is connected to 4 because 4 is 2 squared mod 13. Okay, that's pretty clear. But zero is also connected to three because three is something squared mod 13, namely four squared, right? Because 16 mod 13 is three. So zero is also connected to three. And so you could show zero is going to be connected to one, three, four, and also negative one, negative three, and negative four, but nothing else. And so if you draw this picture, 
uh, you see there's a very symmetric object coming out, this beautiful object, the Paley graph, which is known to have all kinds of excellent regularity properties, and in many ways to mimic random graphs too. Here, here's from Wolfram um, some pictures of other Paley graphs, and you can see they look very symmetrical. This one is a little bit not so symmetrical. This is the one on nine vertices, because nine is a square of a prime instead of a prime. It's a little more complicated. But anyway, so you've got these very symmetric objects, the Paley graphs, and um, it's easy to check, although I'm not going to show the details, that using properties of the Paley graph, they achieve this bound of zero uh, energy. So the, the construction is not just the Paley graph. You put plus signs on the Paley graph's edges. You put minus signs on the complement. So the complement here means all the edges that are in the complete graph but are not in the Paley graph. Okay, so all the other, the missing edges, they get negative signs. And then you add one more node that you sort of put in the middle of the picture and connect that with negative signs to everything. And then you can check just by looking at properties of the Paley graph or counting, that will have the property of being jammed and having zero energy. So um, now that's, that shows that bound is tight. There are lots of other jam states. I don't want to discuss them in great detail. We have results about their structure. They have modular. Um, structure, they're sort of built up of many balanced sub-graphs. But the, the main point is that this part of the talk we consider a little bit disappointing. That is, um, we were looking for something that would always lead to balance and we're getting hung up on these jam states. Though there is a conjecture that you could ask, like maybe it's rare to go to these jam states. What's the size of their basin of attraction? You know, or, or to put it a different way, what's the probability th that gradient descent won't take you to a min, a global min. Does that probability go, you know, is it, is it surefire in the limit as n goes to infinity? And I think it might actually work, but we don't know how to prove it. That is, I think it might actually always balance with probability one as n goes to infinity, but um, I leave that for the probabilists to, to prove. Um, we could not find a proof. So I'm thinking of Lionel, for instance, maybe could prove that. <laughs> or somebody else, okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so now let's move on to the end of the talk, which is the part where differential equations will come in a little, and I can start participating more. Um, so now, continuous dynamical systems. Here's, here's a proposal from uh, three scientists in Poland who I don't happen to know. Um, Kulikowski, his, his L has a little slash through it, which I don't know how to do on my computer. But um, so anyway, Kulikowski, Gauronski, and Gronek wrote down this idea. Suppose that the edge weight is not just a plus or a minus, but a real number that could be positive or negative. So now it's not just I like you or I hate you, but there's intensity. Well, it might be a little bit, a lot. Okay, there, that's a little more realistic. And then they wrote down this dynamical system which seems pretty plausible if you think about it for a second. So xij, how much does i feel, and by the way this is going to be assumed symmetric, so whatever i feels about j it's reciprocated. Um, how do I decide if I want to improve, if I, should I start liking j more or less? What it does is consult what third parties think about j. That is, here, I know what I feel about K, and this is what K feels about J. So if, if I agree with K, that is if I, XIK is, say, very positive and so is XKJ, that makes a positive contribution to how I feels about J. So basically, when you agree with what third parties think about J, um, if, they, if those third parties are your friends, then you go up in what you feel about J. If you disagree with your enemies, that might also help you. <laughs> that is, you, uh, you, maybe I'm making a meal of it. Do, do you see what, that this is natural? Yeah, all right, sorry, I'll just be quiet. <laughs> right. So now th that's a, then a plausible way to update xij and um, in continuous time. And xii? yes? Ah, good question, right. xii, yeah, we include xii to keep the math nice. Though you realize that XII is how much I love myself or hate myself. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a little hard to interpret what this means in the model other than, you know, like why would you, that is, I don't know what I think about myself until I ask you what you think about me. 
And um, is that plausible? I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe for certain personality types. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, um, I don't really claim to justify what's going on on the diagonal. I just know that the math is a lot nicer if I leave it in there. So it, it is a bit weird to think about the diagonal. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so yes, good point. But anyway, so this system has the desired property, which we conjecture the discrete system also has, but this one provably has the property that it balances generically for um, typical initial conditions. So the statement is, if, if xij uh, is initially obeys the symmetry that xij at time zero is xji, then for generic initial conditions, which I'll explain in a minute what that means, and normalized appropriately, this will converge in finite time. The xij, which you could think of as a matrix with elements xij, then uh, normalized by the Frobenius norm of that matrix. The reason I need to do that is that these x's are going to blow up. You may have already noticed that this system looks like it's going to blow up. It will. But so let's not worry about that just yet. And normalized by the magnitude, the norm of x. Th this xij matrix will converge to a rank 1 matrix that is just the outer product of some vector y with itself. It's just yi, it's a typical matrix element converges to yi times yj for some numbers. Is that, what, is that converging when it blows up? I've normalized. Oh, you mean when does it happen? Yeah, yeah good. So Ruben's question is when does this converging happen? So it's the way that the, the picture, here's what happens. The x's are about to blow up, but before they blow up, their sign pattern stabilizes and then doesn't change after that. So there's, there's two things that happen. First you start with some random state. You go to a place where your sign pattern, you know, everybody, the edges are figuring out what signs they want to have. How do I feel about Poland and Austria-Hungary? Once everyone has figured that out, the sign patterns stop changing and then everything starts amplifying. I hate you, I hate you, I'm, you know, I really start hating you. So then the blow up happens but the sign patterns are fixed and so our interpretation is that we're only interested in what happens once the sign pattern is stabilized and after that the model doesn't make sense really and so we don't care that it blows up but um, you could also fix the model by adding like negative x to the fourth instead of you know I just have x squared kind of at the moment so we could stabilize it artificially and that's what um, Kuwakowski and company did but the math again is easier if you just leave it like this but I do want to emphasize this thing about the tremendous collapse of information that we started with n squared numbers in this matrix xij and we have now boiled it down to n numbers this vector y there's some in other words it's like we lost a lot of information and that's what always happens in a self-organizing system that's what it means to be self-organizing you started from something high dimensional and you collapse to something low dimensional so here, that's the claim, that, that in the end, the matrix elements are just yi times yj, and that is automatically balanced. So let me first explain why, if this is true, this means it's self-balancing. That's pretty easy to see. Um, if it really is true that xij is just a scaled version of yi, yj, it's balanced, which you can see either by thinking locally or globally. So remember, locally, we want to look around a triangle and ask, is the product of the signs positive? And you can see it is because everything occurs twice. I got yi, yk here, yk, yj here, yi, yj there. So multiply it and then everything's getting squared, that's positive. So every triangle is balanced if we have this structure. But you can also see it in terms of polarization globally. This is a more interesting way of looking at it, which is what, what this vector y is doing is it's laying out all nodes on a spectrum. You could think of it as a political spectrum. Um, and it says that the negative, negative doesn't mean hate. Negative means, think of it as left wing and right wing, roughly. <laughs> that is, literally, there's y's to the left of zero and y's to the right of zero. And the rule is going to be that everybody on the left of zero likes each other and everybody on the right of zero likes each other but they don't like those on the other side of zero. And that makes sense, right? I mean, if I multiply a negative y times a positive y, that's going to give a negative edge between them. They don't like each other. So um, this splits the system into two factions based on where they are with respect to zero. And some of this might remind you of, 
other things you've seen in, in linear algebra, let's say, or like, you know, where there's a power method where you're raising a matrix to a high power and then sometimes it converges to just something controlled by the dominant eigenvector. Or um, th these are a little bit different, like, it, or also in the theory of random walks, there's, uh, there are values defined on the nodes, say the probability of visiting a given node in a random walk. And then that's gonna, that probability distribution as you keep iterating, um, moving forward in the Markov chain, that will converge to some stationary probability distribution. But that's taking information on the nodes and mapping it to the nodes. Here we're going from edges to nodes. So it's a little different. Um, but anyway, there is this big collapse of information. So, oh, I, this is just a little eye candy since it's towards the end of the lecture. It does, I won't really show you much, but I just kind of like it. It's a picture of what this dynamical system does to the complete graph, where I'm using red and green edges as before. But um, we're going to watch as the edges try to sort out their feelings. That is how the nodes try to sort out their feelings for each other. So you'll see some edges get green or that were red and vice versa, but that will happen pretty early on. And after that is this intensification period where what's going to happen is that the graph just starts getting more and more polarized. But nobody changes their color. So you have to watch. All the good stuff happens early on. Um, there. Now you see the colors are getting a little more intense. Once everybody figures it out, it starts to look like a Rubik's Cube. Uh, it's just solving itself. <laughs> This is one of these graph plotting algorithms where you're imagining springs between different nodes based on the strength of the, you know, with strengths that depend on the value of x. So everything gets itself uncorked and then it's done. <laughs> Polarized. All right. So I don't know what that showed you, but there it is. Now, uh, <laughs> so now matrix uh, way of thinking about this is very natural because as we said, this system that I wrote down is equivalent to just x dot is x squared for a matrix. And so that can be solved easily by um, diagonalization. That is, if we started with a symmetric matrix, we can diagonalize it. That's going to give us a set of scalar differential equations for the diagonal elements, solve those, and um, then come back to the original coordinates. So the diagonalization part, we're just diagonalizing a symmetric matrix. Um, this is more to establish notation than anything else. So x0 is, is an orthogonal matrix times d, a diagonal matrix at time 0 that contains the eigenvalues of the original x. And I'm going to order the eigenvalues from the biggest, the, that is the most positive, is lambda 1. That's the thing to keep in mind. The most positive one is lambda 1 down to the most negative, or at least the least, lambda n. And we'll use notation omega 1 through omega n for the associated eigenvectors. So, all right, we diagonalize, and let's first just solve this differential equation for the di case of diagonal matrices. That's pretty easy. So then we'd be starting with just lambdas on the diagonal. Uh, solving dx equals x squared, well, you know, squaring a diagonal matrix keeps it diagonal. And um, so we can solve for d at later times by just solving dx dt as x squared for a scalar. And it gives this result on the bottom, um, lambda k over 1 minus lambda kt, which does blow up at a certain time, 1 over lambda k. Next, um, going back to the symmetric case, the, the general solution can be written just as the d that we just computed rotated back into these coordinates, so q dt q transpose. That, that solves the ODE and it has the right initial condition and by uniqueness it's, it's our answer. So we now have the solution for all time, but how does it behave? Well, that depends on what, which um, diagonal element is growing the fastest. That dominates everything and uh, that happens at a time, the blow up occurs at time 1 over lambda 1. The largest eigenvalue, the most positive one, controls things. Because it can be shown, I won't show the, the details here, they're in a paper that we published recently in um, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So you can show that with probability going to 1 as n goes to infinity, this largest eigenvalue in the spectrum is going to be positive. And it will be distinct from the second largest, generically, uh, and that's really all we need for now. 
because then we've got this one uh, entry blowing up uh, faster than anything else. So as T approaches that blow up time, this matrix X normalized by the, the Frobenius norm just approaches what you would get from that main eigenvector omega 1. So omega 1, omega 1 transpose is this rank 1 matrix that I was saying is what the whole system collapses to. And so the normalized xij is then just the product of yi, yj, where those are the components of this um, eigenvector. Okay, so th what we've shown up till this point is that um, this system collapses to this rank 1 matrix in finite time. And let me finish by saying uh, something that, that Sid Redner and company had seen in their work too, but weren't quite able to prove, but which can be proven easily here, which is that this system has a phase transition with respect to how much do people like each other initially. Okay, that's what determines what our balanced universe is going to be in the long run. Do people basically start out liking random strangers or not? So let me put it a little more precisely. We're using here some random matrix theory results standard ones um, from Furity and Komlosh, but I hope that, uh, yeah, I guess that's readable. So we start with a symmetric uh, matrix again, and let's pick the elements of the matrix now um, at random from a common distribution with mean mu variance sigma squared. For technical reasons, we don't want to allow infinite tail, so let's suppose it's bounded support and it's symmetric about its mean. So you could think, if you want, of a uniform distribution, say, centered around mu. Um, then, with probability 1, or approaching 1 as n goes to infinity, if, if your typical instinct is to not like a random other person, if the mean friendliness mu is negative, this world will evolve to two factions of equal size. It'll split into, it'll balance, but it will do so in the polarized way. And, and you can show that they're going to be about equal size. Um, and that comes because you can prove for matrices of this class that all sign patterns are equally likely for the components of this leading eigenvector. And so that means that um, in the large n limit, half of the components will be positive and half will be negative. And since, remember, I showed you that picture arrayed on the axis where there was the green, or the blue dots and the orange dots, you know, since there's this spectrum that determines um, spe political spectrum, not eigenvalue spectrum, that determines <laughs> how you feel about each other. If half the components are positive and half negative, that means that the world has split into two factions of equal size. So that's what happens if, if the initial friendliness is negative. Also, we can estimate how long it takes for the blow up. It goes like one over the square root of the number of um, elements because of a standard result about the eigenvalue lambda 1. So th on the other hand, if the predisposition is to like other people, then the world ends up in paradise. As soon as mu is positive, all edges will be friendly with probability 1. Um, and that's because when mu is positive, the dominant eigenvector approaches 1, 1, 1. And it actually balances itself faster in time that goes like 1 over n instead of 1 over square root of n. So um, I think there's a little moral lesson here, although I don't really want to use this to teach morality, but you know, it seems like it's saying that there, a little extra friendliness can make a big difference. That is, if you, um, here, like sometimes it's asked, you know, suppose you have these implacably opposed factions. There's, I, here's a real example. In the Senate right now, um, in the United States, it's a very polarized time politically. There used to be a thing where they could all eat together in a room with some you know, servants who were feeding them. And it was just routine. That's one of the perks of being a congressperson. You could go eat in the room. And people would sit there and eat and talk and make deals. They don't go anymore. The guy that's the servant says nobody comes anymore. So why is that relevant to this? Because if, if this parameter mu, the mean friendliness, moves up just a little bit, maybe because you ate lunch with the person, that might end up leading to a world where there's a much more consensus. Okay, forget about that. The, as far as the math model, what I'm showing here is just that um, if the mean was positive, you started with a big array of positive and negative xij's, but they all ended up green, and so all in the same faction. Whereas when it was zero, mutual indifference on average, or even mutual hostility, 
those end up equally split between the red and green camps and, and the world is polarized. So just nudging mu a little bit past zero makes a big difference. All right, thanks. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I should also thank various sponsors. So um, NSF provided support for me and Cornell University has been a wonderful place to work for now 17 years since I left this wonderful place. And um, my collaborators, the Kleinberg brothers, have a lot of other support. And so there's some of their support. Thank you. Okay. Okay, happy to take some questions. Yes, Jim. Before I ask my question, I just want to say you've given me this wonderful image of a kind of Obervolfach solution to the problems in Congress where people are forced to sit in assigned places and eat together. I think that I think there's a lot of truth to the idea that that having people do something that seems irrelevant but might make them feel friendlier towards each other might be very relevant. I I kind of want to believe that. I don't know if I could prove it, but I do want to believe it. And my question is, um, the sort of thing a physicist has probably asked you before is, what if instead of having steepest descent, you have some sort of heat bath kind of dynamics where you might go uphill, but you're more mm. than Yes, that's very good, right. So the question was, um, yeah, they're repeating the question. The question was, um, I gave a zero temperature version of dynamics where you only can go downhill. Um, and in fact, you don't even allow sideways moves. Whereas in, in your paper, you did allow, I think, with equal probability to move sideways. Or, and, and you could certainly include a temperature that says occasionally with some low probability make an uphill move, and it might get you out of a well. And we haven't studied it. It's, of, of course, very natural to ask that question. We don't know the answer to anything about that. Um, yes? Um, this is the question was how does the network topology affect the likelihood of getting jammed? Would certain kinds of networks like scale-free networks or erdos rainy random graphs or whatever have better or worse jamming properties than the complete graph? This is going to be a tough question period because I pretty much told you what I know. And so <laughs> I can say I don't know many times. Um, possibly other people do know. I don't know. I, I mean, this is quite new. I think it's fair to say. There, we only saw the paper by Redner and company. There's a work we did. There's this group from Poland that did something. But the literature is not extensive. It's about four papers, five papers. So um, I think it's a really cool area to work in, but I haven't done much beyond, I have done nothing beyond what I told you. And also I want to ask, is there any generalization of the Hydro rule and, and these, um, uh, and these to directed networks? To directed networks? Yeah. Um, I think that the, the sociologists may have considered a few generalizations for the static case where they either have directed networks. I know that they've definitely looked at the case where the uh, three mutual enemies is considered balanced. That is, uh, as opposed to here, we considered it unbalanced. And showed that if you allow that, then you can have any number of factions as a balanced state. So this was always a big knock against the model studied here, that it only predicts a bipolar world that doesn't account for more factions. So that's one generalization. That's not your, the one you're asking about, the directed case. But um, I, I think that the directed case has been looked at, but I'm not sure what to say about it. Oh, okay. Yes? I'm curious about these jam states that are strictly jammed. Yes. So if you're at a jam state that's not strictly jammed, then there's, some, uh, there's basically some component of states that you can access without changing the energy. Right. There's a neutral direction. If you, the question was if you have jam states that aren't strictly jammed. You could, that's what I say, moving sideways. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so by moving sideways, is it... Uh, I guess likely to unjam the state? Um, I don't know if it's likely. It, it's, you know, it seems like it couldn't hurt. You're currently not going downhill, so try next door. Um, but that's a, it's an interesting, I think that's what Sid looked at, uh, Sid Redner, and, that they allowed when you were able to move sideways, you flip a coin whether to do it or not. And I think empirically in the computer simulations, these systems look like they unjam themselves. Isn't that correct? 
I mean, with very high probability. They, they seem to eventually go downhill to balance. But I don't have any quantitative information for you about, like, um, you know, it, it's, the conjecture is that that would always unbalance the system w with probability approaching one as n goes to infinity. But I don't know that to be a fact. Um, yeah, it, I, I think that's right, but don't know. Okay, yeah. Uh, what kind of ingredient would you imagine to have oscillatory systems, like to get the, the system to be two-dimensional in time? Let's see, the question is, um, instead of just thinking of gradient descent, which has a kind of monotonic behavior, you want something that could oscillate. Yeah, so, having some oscillatory relationships. Love-hate relationship or something, I loved you, now I hate you. Like cycles of is, feeling. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, well, let's see. So if we wanted to have some time dependence in the relationships that was uh, like that, I suppose we don't want to just think about gradient descent. We need something that has inertia, you know, speaking physically, like that if I liked you on the last time step, I'm more likely to, you don't know, either keep liking you, but then I, I'm not sure what, what I would assume. I mean, just as a rule of thumb, in, in dynamics, you want second order differential equations. Those tend to have oscillations. First order things usually don't. So I'm guessing, that's why I guess I want to put inertia in, but I don't quite see how that will help yet. Uh, hmm. m m yeah, I mean, I, guess, I don't know what that would mean exactly in the framework here. Well, that's, that's a question. I mean, like, yeah, I don't know. Like these oscillations occur? Uh, yes, they could. Maybe another thing to emphasize, in case it's not clear how limited this model is, is um, that there are many things going on that could be construed as plus and minus relationships. So I, I make plus and minus into, uh, you know, I like you, I don't like you. But like there are things, this is a real issue nowadays in online social networks where people can sometimes say, is this person your friend or foe? It could mean that. You can also do on like recommender systems, do I trust this person's opinion or I don't trust them? That can be a plus or a minus. That's different from I like them or I don't like them. Another thing is, um, do I feel superior to this person or inferior? So status is another interesting thing that happens on networks. And so like the transitive rule holds more for status than for balance. If I feel superior to you and you feel superior to someone else, then I surely feel superior to that person. Uh, whereas with friend of a friend or enemy of an enemy, it would be different. So Kleinberg and his, John Kleinberg and his collaborators have looked at some data about online social networks and what uh, the way pluses and minuses are assigned and how they change. And they find that status is generally more important in predicting what goes on than, than balance. That people are more aware of how they feel in some status hierarchy when they're deciding how to update their feelings than they do um, about the psychological consistency of balance. So I, I'm not sure that has a huge connection to things in the real world, including oscillatory relationships. But in some settings, it might. OK, maybe one last question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question about this jamming. One obvious way to solve this problem is to allow to flip, for example, two edges of the mm, That's nice, yes. Or three, or n. Sure, you could have coordinated flips, yes. Right. And and then there would be much more difficult to construct a gem state. That sounds right, yes. So are there any results about how big the network has to be to allow an M gem state and, uh, and so on? Oh, jam, do you mean if, if you allow double flips or triple yeah, flips? Yes. Jam, even no. If you allow no, I have no, nothing for you. Except that, uh, you know, words of encouragement that if you like this, <laughs> go for it. It's your, the field is yours. <laughs> ah, yes, you have more. Yeah, <laughs> Model. Yeah. Then you start with a matrix with zeros on the diagonal. Uh, hmm. I, we we did have different distributions for the diagonal elements than for the off diagonal. I mean, you have the theorem that with probability one uh, lambda one is zero when n is large and so on. So in that theorem. Wait. Say that again. Lambda one yeah, is yeah, zero. No, I didn't mean lambda to say that. Lambda one is positive. Yes. Yes. The yes. So so, what was the uh, the diagonal elements in that theorem? Um. They. They, they could be, just picked any IID from any um, reasonable distribution. I mean, they don't have to be the same distribution as the, as the off diagonal. The, the reason that lambda 1 is positive, typically, is from um, anything that satisfies Wigner's semicircle 
theorem will have a, a distribution of eigenvalues that has some positive and some negative. And so if you, if you don't have a positive, I mean, when you have the positive mu, that gives you a large eigenvalue that breaks away from the semicircle distribution. But even if you have zero or negative mu, you still have that positive edge of the semicircle giving you the square root of n size and eigenvalue. The diagonal doesn't change that yeah. at all. No. So it won't matter. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you.